So if goods are coming into the, the UK from the EU, they're classed as an import. Previously, if a business was buying goods from the EU, the seller would request the UK business's VAT number and then they wouldn't charge German VAT or whatever the, the source country on the basis that they were making a B2B supply into the UK. Those rules no longer apply. Um, a UK seller doesn't need to request the VAT number of a, a UK business in order to not charge the local VAT. However, there's an import declaration in the UK and import VAT is payable or reportable. Either needs to be paid at the time the goods come into the country or it can be postponed and reported through the VAT returns, which I'll speak about in a minute. Incoterms, so as I mentioned there, uh, it's a terminology that means um, it's a trade terms that you agree with your customer and they determine who incurs all the costs involved in the supply chain and the risk, so who needs to be insured and who would be liable if the goods are lost at a certain point in time. They're contractually binding. So if you have a customer who says we're selling goods on an ex-works basis or uh, delivered duty paid, that's the INCO term. And it can be really important uh, when it comes to import VAT because those INCO terms de determine who will be named as the importer of record on the import declaration. Any INCO term delivered at place, X works, etc. Um, mean that the customer, the UK customer, is the person who's liable for import VAT unless the seller sends on a delivered duty paid basis. So delivered duty paid, DDP, you might come across, is a terminology that means the seller is responsible for every cost and every liability in getting those goods from the seller's door to the customer's door. And that includes clearance through customs and payment of any import VAT or any duty that's payable. So I mentioned duty, import VAT, largely a reporting exercise but customs duty, if payable, is a cost. It's not, you cannot claim it back um, as such. So if you are going to incur customs duty, you want to make sure that you're definitely only incurring duty that's due and that it's the right amount of duty and that the right person pays that duty depending on your commercial terms that you've agreed. If you get to the point where there is duty payable, then generally it's payable at the time of import. That's the starting point. Most of the time that would be via a freight agent or a courier who's paying that on your behalf. And then they'll recharge it to you and they might um, give you payment terms. But the starting point is import date, duty payable. So if there's a client who's regularly importing and paying customs duty, they may want to consider having a duty deferment account so that they don't need to consistently be paying couriers as and when imports uh, come into the country. A duty deferment account needs to be applied for from HMRC. Prior approval uh, has to be given. It allows no duty to be payable at the point of import and it all to be deferred until the following month and payable by direct debit on the 15th of the following month. Duty deferment accounts are available for any business, whether they're established in the UK or non-established, but some businesses have to provide a financial guarantee to HMRC in order to be granted the account. As you can imagine, there's a risk to the revenue uh, for unpaid duty if it gets deferred. There is the possibility for UK businesses to apply for a guarantee waiver, which is the request to not pay a guarantee, but they must have a good financial history and a good HMRC compliance history. So if there's duty payable at the time of import, you may want to look at duty suspension regimes. And these are typically 
where a business is incurring duty, but um, the, there's a possibility within the supply chain that the goods would be re-exported from the UK. And so uh, you would, wouldn't want to incur duty on goods that are not going to be used or finally consumed in the UK. So there are some regimes available um, for imports where there's that overall or possibility of that intention for re-export. Um, again, you might, in some circumstances, need to provide a guarantee to use these, and some of the regimes require prior approval and some don't. One of them that you may have heard of before is called inward processing. And the way it works is uh, you import into the UK from, say you buy, um, I've used the example here of steel from China. Uh, you tell HMRC at the point of import you're using inward processing and no import VAT and no duty is payable at that point in time when the goods come in to the UK. There are then usually set time limits, uh, depending on the authorisation, um, between six months for a, a basic simplified authorisation through to typically three years is the most I've seen, I think. They have that amount of time in order to hold the, the stock without paying the duty, process it, manufacture it, whatever they're going to do with it. And then in the scenario I've given, if all of the finished products, all of the material that was imported ended up in finished products that was exported to Germany, that fulfills inward processing. The goods have been re-exported. They've not been consumed in the UK. So no duty is payable um, at all on that import. If perhaps a, they got an order and a proportion of those goods ended up going to a UK customer, at the point the goods leave to go to the customer, usually duty is payable to HMRC then just on that proportion. This inward processing can be used on occasion without prior approval from HMRC. So in an urgent scenario of a client asking the question of I've got a, you know, an, an import coming and there's duty due, there's the potential for it to just be um, dealt with through the import declaration. But you can only do that three times a year. If this would, was a regular uh, supply chain pattern, you'd be looking at approval from HMRC to do it on a regular basis. There are returns that have to be submitted to HMRC. And also if there was duty payable at any point, there are um, um, declarations that need to be made to HMRC. So there's a bit of admin involved in it, but also potential uh, savings to be had. Temporary admission uh, has been one uh, a relief that we've heard a little bit about this year that maybe wasn't used so much and it's typically for goods that are coming in um, temporarily, funnily enough, uh, into the UK and that with the intention of them being used briefly and then taken back out again. There is a list of circumstances where this is allowed. It's not for every type of good, but the, the typical examples are goods going to be displayed at an exhibition or uh, equipment that's going to be used audiovisual or in the media industry film industry people use this fairly often so it's coming in temporarily to perform a service and then it's going to go back out again in the same state that it was when it came into the country so this relief um, allows you to not have to pay customs duty so even if you know, you're bringing in cameras and audiovisual equipment that is of Chinese origin, for example, uh, but you're bringing it in from Germany to use for a film shoot. No duty, so long as you uh, use this temporary admission uh, on the import declaration. And then, so long as the goods go back out again, no duty is payable. If for some reason uh, the goods were diverted again, they were, they were sold while they were in the UK, there might be duty pay payable. Return goods relief is a relief that has again actually been in the news a little bit with uh, some retailers and e-commerce businesses having problems 
where they've sold uh, products to their customers outside the UK and then they're being returned because they didn't fit or they, you know, uh, they were faulty. So returned goods relief is available on the re-import. And all of these reliefs um, require the cooperation and the assistance of a courier or a freight company, whoever is dealing with the transport of these goods. Uh, return goods relief is only for goods in their same state. So it's designed for uh, simply returned goods in the same state. You can't use it if they've been processed or changed or altered in some way. Uh, in the in the other country. Moving on to the opposite direction, of course, goods leaving the UK are exports now. So, thinking about before Brexit, if a business was sending goods to the EU, you would have the typical process of asking the customer for their VAT number to prove that they're um, in business and that it's a EU to EU business supply zero rated for VAT. That doesn't have to happen anymore. Uh, basically, if the goods are leaving the UK, whoever the customer is, they're, they're zero rated. They're a zero rated export. That means proof of export is essential. And that doesn't mean to say that every business needs to have huge folders full of paperwork um, or huge files in their folder. They just at the very least need to be comfortable that if HMRC asked for proof that the goods have been exported, that they either have that proof or they can get it from their freight agent. The most common proof of export is the C88 form, also known as a single administrative document. So terminology gets used in mixed fashion. It's the same thing. Um, there are simplified printouts that um, some businesses get as well, rather than the full C88, which are usually sufficient for HMRC as well. And the, the concern with exports, so goods leaving the UK, is yes, they're zero rated for UK VAT purposes, but what's the position in the receiving country? There's probably going to, if they're going to the EU, there's going to be import VAT, there might be duty, like we said. So is there a commercial concern there? Are they comfortable that their customer will happily pay import VAT? might not be a cost to the customer, but there's a slight hassle factor in having to either pay a courier or a freight agent or make sure if the country, receiving country has postponed or reverse charge um, accounting that they, that they do that correctly. So we've had uh, some of our uh, clients who didn't expect to have any concern with their B2B supplies into the EU because their businesses, they'll pay import VAT, they'll claim it back, it'll be fine. And actually, the customers have said, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. That's too much hassle. We'll find another supplier in the EU. And we've had clients lose business because of it. And one way to deal with that is to change the INCO terms that we mentioned before and tell your customer, well, we'll, we'll sell to you on a delivered duty paid basis so that you, the customer, doesn't have any hassle, nothing changes for them. They don't need to deal with anything else. They just get the goods to their door. And that's fine, but it could have an impact on the uh, seller, the UK businesses position in the EU. They might need to be VAT registered in order to be an importer and clear the goods through customs. So that's the consideration there for our clients. Supply and install goods, that's um, cropped up a few times for us where um, supply and install contracts typically the contract terms don't allow title to goods being installed to transfer until they've been installed. And so we've had um, businesses, UK businesses, supplying and installing in the EU, and the customer has just refused to be the importer of the products because they don't own them at that point in time. They don't own them until they've been fitted into their building or whatever's happening. So again, we've had clients who've had to act as an importer into the EU VAT register um, and, and deal with the, the, the VAT and the duty in the EU. If a UK business is required to VAT register in the EU, 
then they might have to appoint a fiscal representative. A fiscal representative is a locally established business or individual who is jointly and severally liable for any VAT payments or liabilities in that country. Um, it's required in the EU but not in every country. So some countries require it and some don't. Spain requires it, for example. And there was some countries have made special rules specifically for UK businesses to say it's not required. But um, if it is required, it's an additional cost, effectively. You've got to pay for somebody to be your representative um, for the, and it's usually an annual fee. We also have had clients mentioning indirect representation. Uh, now this is something that is applied very inconsistently, but in theory, it's the same thing as fiscal representation, but for customs duty. So it's somebody who's jointly and severally liable for the payment of any customs duty in the EU. And the starting point is that any non-established business importing into the EU requires indirect representation, but it is not being applied consistently at the moment, which makes things a little bit difficult to advise clients on. If it is required, the starting point is the courier or the freight agent. They will hopefully offer that service for a small percentage of the import value in order to cover off the risk. There are also new rules for e-commerce businesses selling into the EU, um, which I'm going to talk about now. So if everything I've spoken about before is more typically for business to business transactions um, and some business to, to consumer transactions but there are specific rules in relation to business to consumer so when you're selling direct to an end customer a shopper for example um, which have come into place in the UK since the 1st of January and then the EU since the 1st of July the rules are designed to um, avoid overseas businesses having VAT liabilities that they do not pay to HMRC. Um, so your typical example would be an overseas seller selling through Amazon, uh, that they have no presence in the UK, you know, they're established in Singapore and they sell goods from a stock base in the UK. And there's been a lot of cases of VAT debts just not paid from these businesses. So the uh, government and HMRC and then also in the EU they've implemented rules that mean the marketplaces so Amazon, eBay, um, they have to pay any sales VAT that's due instead of the business. Uh, that means that VAT registration may or may not be required for these businesses anymore um, and the, the rules extend to other uh, trading platforms on the uh, uh, it's not just Amazon and eBay, so it's anybody who's facilitating customer orders, certain it's setting the terms and conditions, etc. So any kind of platform like that, they might be liable instead. It just raises the question about, um, for some of our clients, whether they need to be VAT registered or not. Typically, they wouldn't need to be if it's all low value goods under £135 because there's no import VAT payable on, low, on goods under £135 anymore at the time of import. Um, so, in that case, the overseas seller is not incurring VAT in the UK and is no longer liable to charge VAT because Marketplace is doing it so they can deregister. If, however, they are importing bulk stock into you know, an Amazon warehouse that's over £135, there's still import VAT to be paid or reportable, so these overseas businesses still need to be VAT registered. Um, the rules, the new rules in the EU also impact UK businesses selling in the EU. So if the, a UK business is selling low value goods under €150 Euro into the EU, they might have to consider their requirements. Um, and also if a UK business is holding a stock base in the EU, again for example if they had stock in the um, Czech Amazon warehouses, then they might still have new reporting requirements in the EU. So you may have heard about the one-stop shop and the import one-stop shop. 
one-stop shop is for intra-EU e-commerce transactions and import one-stop shop is for anything that's coming into the EU uh, from outside the EU. So things that have cropped up for our clients, um, overseas businesses selling direct to the UK from their own warehouse, uh, from their own website, sorry, so they're not selling through Amazon, eBay, etc. They need a VAT registration requirement if those goods are under £135. There's no VAT registration threshold. Uh, it's because there's no import VAT on anything under £135, so you need sales VAT on that instead. UK businesses selling to EU customers from their own w website. So if you've got, um, let's say, Boots, we're selling um, products to customers, end customers in Spain, Portugal, wherever. They, the starting point would be that there's an import into the EU. Who's paying the import VAT? Do they want um, the, the customer in Spain to have to deal with that? I think there are quite a few e-commerce businesses who are re rethinking their supply chain because of the, the customs requirements now. And then we come to Northern Ireland, um, which has its own set, set of rules. Effectively, the um, agreement with Northern Ireland means that it's, for VAT purposes, still treated as being part of the EU. So everything I've just said about transactions between the UK really should be Great Britain, uh, between Great Britain and the EU. Um, the rules for Northern Ireland are different. So if you have um, a Northern Ireland business, it's still going to be registered for UK VAT, and trading between Great Britain and Northern Ireland is still UK VATable. That's just been treated um, like normal. But you may see Northern Irish businesses using XI uh, when, if they're importing and exporting in and out of Northern Ireland. Uh, EU businesses, so if you, have an e if you have a Northern Ireland client and they are asking about purchasing from the EU, then they are back to the old rules Acquisition VAT, box two of the VAT return is still there for Northern Ireland purchases from the EU. So it's different um, for Northern Ireland businesses. If you are an EU business and it's selling to Northern Ireland, they need to get the um, VAT number in order to zero rate it. It's old rules. And the same goes for EU businesses selling to consumers in Northern Ireland old rules or actually old new rules because it's the old distant selling rules which have changed to be import one-stop shop and, and one-stop shop registration depending on where the stock is moving from and then the reverse so if you have northern ireland businesses selling to end consumers in the eu they follow the eu vat registration rules one-stop shop um, required but the Northern Ireland rules only apply to goods. They don't apply to services. Just to complicate it for us, um, the supply of services between Northern Ireland and the EU, um, there's no differential between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. The other thing that's changed is that prior to Brexit, we used to be part of the mini one-stop shop a regime which applied to the whole of the EU and it covered digital uh, services supplied to consumers. So you could have one VAT registration to apply, to, um, apply VAT according to the country where your customer was, whether they were in Poland, Germany or the UK, it was one VAT return. Um, we're no longer a part of that and it means that if non-UK businesses are providing digital services in the UK, even if they've got an EU VAT registration for accounting for VAT in the EU, they need a separate UK VAT registration uh, in order to account for UK VAT on digital services. The other thing that's changed is VAT refunds for overseas businesses. If you have a client, a UK client, who's incurred VAT on costs in the EU, they will still be able to claim that back, but it's a different claim process and so far it is tedious and also the claim year has changed um, the year runs from July to June 
and then the deadline for submission is the end of December. Food and drink continues to be complicated for VAT purposes, um, can't really complain, uh, keeps us in a job when things are complicated but um, some of the issues we've seen recently are along the lines of confectionery products which are standard rated and where that line is drawn between what's confectionery, what's not, health foods, so there's a lot of things, um, protein bars and um, you know things that are aimed at being nutritious and then the suppliers feel that they can get a zero rating and HMRC feel that it's confectionery and it's standard rated. Um, and since Brexit, a lot of the time we're getting inquiries about, well, the commodity code for this import says that there's no VAT at import. Uh, so we think that means that the product can be zero rated when we sell it. But as I told you before, commodity codes are quite um, broad and they capture lots of categories. So just because something has no import VAT on it doesn't mean that it's zero rated when you sell it. You still need to carefully consider the VAT that you're charging. Ebooks became zero rated from uh, May last year and we've had some inquiries about the scope of that, in particular online subscriptions where the content is primarily written content, articles, um, digests, technical books, etc. Um, and the, the scope for subscription payments to be zero rated. And then medical exemptions, which we've had COVID inquiries um, about COVID tests. HMRC issued some guidance earlier this year about when COVID testing could be exempt from VAT. And there seems to be um, in that sector some more things being outsourced away from the NHS or GPs and the typical providers and then the question arises does that fall within the VAT exemption are there medical professionals involved um, and considerations that have to be made there.